All right, let's talk about B12 absorption. I think it's important before we talk about what causes vitamin B12 deficiency, it's important for you to understand how B12 is actually absorbed. So most of the B12 in the diet comes from meat or animal products. And so, you know, if we're talking about meat, you know, I mean, again, some of you are vegetarian, some of you might be vegan. And if you are a vegan, I would highly encourage you to supplement with vitamin B12. And we'll, we'll talk about why here in just a second. But so this could be meat, but dairy also contains um, B12 as, does, as do eggs. And so some of you may, may be lacto-ovo vegetarian, in which case the dairy and the egg has good quantity of B12. There are some plant sources of B12, but they, they don't add adequate quantities of B12 robust enough in the diet to prevent a major deficiency developing over time. So you got to keep that in mind. So in this diagram here, I've got meat coming into the stomach. And one of the things that happens when you have that meat there, let's, let's change our color here. is you have these parietal cells that line the stomach, okay? And these parietal cells, they do a couple of different things. They produce hydrochloric acid and they produce intrinsic factor or IF, okay? Intrinsic factor in hydrochloric acid. Why is this important? Because the acid breaks the vitamin B12 off of the meat. It, it cleaves it, if you will. So it, it breaks B12 off the meat. Now you got B12 floating around in the stomach and then you have intrinsic factor wraps B12 like a taxi cab and takes it down into your small intestine. It shuttles it down the length of your intestine to the distal small intestine where vitamin B12 is absorbed. And so if you understand that, you understand that two things just from this diagram, right? Actually three. One, you've got to have a source of animal-based food in the diet to obtain adequate B12 if you're not gonna supplement. Number two, hydrochloric acid. In other words, your stomach has to be producing adequate quantities of acid or it becomes more challenging for you to get the B12 off of that animal product. And then number three, the intrinsic factor has to be able to bind that B12 to carry it. It's how it gets into your bloodstream. So those three things really generally need to be present in order to be effective at absorbing B12 properly. Now, I've got, I've got this image I'm gonna pull up for you as well. So, some people have talked about that, you know, in humans that you can produce, the, the bacteria that live in your intestine can actually produce vitamin B12, and that's true, your bacteria can produce vitamin B12. Here's the problem. Um, so if you look here, we've got the stomach, we've got the small intestine, and then we've got the colon or the large intestine. Well, the bacteria that produces B12 largely is inhabiting your colon. And remember what we said earlier, this is why it's so important to understand why and where B12 is absorbed. It's absorbed in the area of the small intestine called the ileum. The distal ileum, um, which is right, the section right before you get to the colon, this is where your B12 goes in. That's what these arrows are representing. They're representing, if you look at the diagram over here, this little half moon blue structure, that's intrinsic factor. That's what we were talking about a minute ago. And then the little red circle, that's B12. So what happens, you see it up here, intrinsic factor is produced in the stomach. It attaches to B12. It shuttles it through your small intestine until we get to the very end of the small intestine where it then is absorbed into the bloodstream. The bacteria in the colon can produce vitamin B12, and that's what you're seeing here. These pill structures, these green pill structures are producing cobalamin, that red circle there. But by the time you're here, there's very little absorption of B12 that can occur. So what, basically what you're doing is the bacteria in your colon are making B12 that then you poop out. And so you're going to have B12 in your poop, but you're not going to have B12 in your bloodstream if you're relying solely on these bacteria to help you produce um, your B12. So again, very, very important. I just want to emphasize that because I know that some of you and maybe many of you are following a vegetarian diet, which I, you know, I think is perfectly fine and safe and healthy for some of you, um, but you want to be aware of, of that because if you 
basically, if you're not getting adequate protein from animals, your liver has about one and a half to two years of B12 in it. And that's from the day you go strict vegetarian. So you, your liver has this ability to store B12. And for most people, it's got about one and a half to two years storage. So a lot of times, and this reason I say it is because a lot of you go, go vegetarian or go vegan and you feel better. And so you're, you're equating that, that diet change to you doing better and you're not wrong, but you get a couple of years into this and your B12 storage starts to run low and then you can start to develop the brain fog, the lethargy, the fatigue. And I just wanna pre-warn anybody who's wanting to be on that, on that plant-based diet to make sure that you supplement. So this is where it's really important to supplement, in my opinion. As some people will say, yeah, but there are certain types of, of foods that are plant-based, certain types of algae and things of that nature where you can get B12. The problem with those types of foods, nori and algae, et cetera, you can't eat enough of those things to get the quantity of B12 to sustain you. There are certain mushrooms as well, like shiitake, but to get enough B12 from shiitake, I mean, you've got to really wolf it down. You have to be eating you know, massive quantities at every one of your meals. It's just, arguably, it's not all that practical for the average person. So again, this is where supplementation can be very, very critical. Now, gluten is another major cause of vitamin B12 deficiency. You heard me mention a minute ago that gluten, uh, you know, we, we, we know that gluten is one of the major contributing factors to, uh, to B12 deficiency. And, and I'm gonna pull this up and show you, uh, show you why. Actually, let's just erase this section and draw on it again. So if we look at, at here, one of the things that gluten does is it damages parietal cells. And so that, what that means is that that will reduce your body's capacity to generate acid. Right, so when you have gluten damaging your parietal cells directly, um, it can cause lowered acid production. We also know that there are, gluten can cause an autoimmune condition. There's an autoimmune type of anemia called pernicious anemia, which affects your production of intrinsic factor. And that's another thing that gluten has been associated with is the triggering of a pernicious anemia. But then the last thing that we know, going back to this other diagram here, um, let's just pull that up, is that gluten also damages this area of the small intestine. So this is a common area that gluten can damage is that distal ileum. So some people where they're getting their gluten atrophy, where they're getting their gluten damages in this area where vitamin B12 is absorbed. So from a gluten, this is one of the reasons why B12 is so commonly associated with gluten sensitivity because gluten causes intrinsic factor um, uh, intrinsic factor autoimmunity potentially, gluten can damage your ability to produce acid and gluten can actually damage the distal small intestine. Now, it's also been shown that gluten causes a form of gastritis, so it damages, aside from just damaging the parietal cells, it can damage the lining of the stomach, leading to other problems as well. But, you know, this is one of the big reasons why we see gluten contributing to vitamin B12 deficiency. So gluten sensitivity, diets that are low in animal protein. We get this a lot, people that take massive quantities of antacids. So, you know, you, you pop the Tums, the Rolaids or whatever brand, the H2 antagonists uh, or the, um, the histamine blockers or the PPIs, the proton pump inhibitors. So these, are, you know, some of these are over the counter and some of these are prescription, but it's very common. You have heartburn, right? What's a, the common scenario is you get heartburn, you visit the doctor, the doctor doesn't really do much, much testing. They just assume that you have heart acid reflux because you are experiencing heartburn and they give you an antacid. You have to understand that you can have the symptoms of what feels like acid reflux when you don't make enough acid. Um, so it's not just too much acid being produced, which is the common kind of theme. Again, when you go visit a doctor, it's oftentimes it's that you have the symptoms of reflux because you don't produce enough stomach acid. And so when you eat food, it sits inside of you and it starts to rot and form putrefication byproducts. These byproducts can be irritants to the GI tract, creating what feels like reflux. And so if your doctor doesn't, doesn't differentiate that, they put you on an antacid, they can actually make the problem worse over time. We also have antibiotic use. We know that chronic antibiotic use especially can contribute to vitamin B12 deficiency. 
Um, but what's also interesting here is because, uh, well, we won't get into that. It's too complicated. Uh, and we know estrogen. So, so like um, women, ladies, if you're taking long history of BCP birth control pills or ladies uh, that are older, if you're using estrogens for menopause symptoms like hot flashes and things of that nature, you've got to watch out because estrogens can deplete your vitamin B12. We know that drugs for seizures, like anticonvulsant medication, so if you've been diagnosed with epilepsy or seizure disorder, those particular classes of medications are known causes of vitamin B12 deficiency. We also know that people going through cancer treatments, getting chemotherapeutic agents, um, that also can cause vitamin B12 deficiency. So these are some of the biggest triggers that we'll see in kind of real world application in today's modern world. So again, your diet could be too low. You could be damaging your intestines by eating gluten. Um, other food allergies can also do this. It's, gluten is not the only thing that food-wise that can damage the GI tract and a number of different medications. Medications, in my opinion, probably one of the biggest causes of nutritional deficiency, period, and that and being that inclusive of B12. Hey, don't forget to check out the rest of the series right here. Make sure you hit subscribe below. And as always, thanks for tuning in.